So thanks again for having me. I'll be presenting on innovation in the Arctic, scoring the circle, which is a little play on words, but uh, essentially my interest is in how can we uh, adapt or, or invent more kind of technological scientific innovations in the Arctic to address many of the social and economic problems that the region faces. So um, many of us are familiar kind of with, this, with the concept of the theory of the creative class. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> much of much of where creativity and entrepreneurship uh, and those kinds of buzzwords is taking place are in large cities. So what's described as the creative class are uh, scientific, artistic, entrepreneurial, or technological kind of you know, experts or, or or characters, and they cluster in large cities, and and so it creates uh, much innovation, competition, uh, sharing of knowledge, knowledge transfer very very seamlessly and quickly. Uh, and this is really what's driving our, our 21st century economy. So it's a big shift from you know manufacturing industrial base of the 20th century to one really driven by services and technology. And that seems to be where most of the economic growth and also social growth is really going to be driven from uh, in, in this coming century, the 21st. So this raises a big question of you know what do rural remote areas do in this kind of economy? What's their role? How is, is the gap going to just grow? There's already a gap between uh, most of the outcomes and indicators between people living in rural areas and people living in cities. And in particular, the Arctic uh, is, is a, a big, you know, suffers, I guess, it suffers the right word, greatly from this kind of divide, where it's already very rural, very remote, uh, where it's already outside forces which are driving activities and events that happen in the Arctic. So if the 21st century is one of uh, a creative class driven by cities, uh, where does this leave the Arctic? Uh, so I wanted to have a, a look at a little bit about what are some of the barriers to Arctic innovation? Uh, why is it that uh, it's mostly outside technologies that come in or are inadequately applied or very expensively applied to the Arctic? Uh, so in my in my you know in my past a couple of years of work, I've been frustrated to note that you know there's a lot of existing technologies. It's not even future technologies, but technologies that exist today can help address some of the chronic is issues that we have. For example, with food insecurity. For example, we can grow food on Mars right now. NASA has a program to grow food in space, and yet it's uh, you know too costly, too prohibitive to grow it in the Arctic. Many places in the Arctic, energy insecurity, where communities are off the grid. Uh, and for a long time, there have been many communities, most rural communities, have been reliant on diesel generation. And as you know, in the past couple of years, diesel has gotten very expensive. It's really cost prohibitive, and energy costs, which you know, Arctic residents use up a lot of energy in the winter, uh, have gotten very prohibitive. Health and education accessibility. In my previous, I had a previous role with University of Arctic, and I've done a lot with post-secondary education. And there was an idea in the 90s and the early 2000s that, you know, the internet and online courses could really revolutionize things. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's still, you know, the, t the connectivity is still a big, a big problem. Uh, and, and it makes it very frustrating for students to feel isolated, to feel like they may connect, they may not connect. Uh, instructors often are not very good at using uh, online education, using it in a really pedagogically sophisticated way. And the same for health. Uh, in Canada, for example, there was a big push for telehealth in the, in the early 2000s, but there's been a lot of resistance amongst healthcare professionals to adopt it. Uh, sometimes they don't see the value. It doesn't help sometimes in the emergency. If the connectivity goes out, you can't really rely on it. Uh, so there's all these existing technologies that are just kind of uh, immature, I would say, uh, in their use in the Arctic. <clears throat> so what are some of the reasons for that uh, that I've noticed, that I've observed? One uh, big one. Uh, maybe the biggest is really a lack of educational attainment and STEM proficiency, so science, technology, engineering, math proficiency in the north. So where you know <clears throat> where northerners uh, may benefit from some of these if they are to be northern driven, and, and we all agree it doesn't help to impose these things from the south to say here's a great idea, do it, start it. That doesn't seem to ever work. But for northerners to be driving that process. They have to have a better understanding of, you know, the technology and the process and how it can work and how it can be applied in, in the north. So as long as in the Canadian Arctic, for example, it's similar in Greenland, Russia, and Alaska, you have high school attainment rates of, you know, 50% or lower in the rural areas, and there's still a, a resistance or there's a lack of 
uh, acceptance uh, for kind of Western scientific con uh, concepts, which are often fundamentally, uh, you know, diametrically opposed to traditional knowledge kinds of concepts, not always, but sometimes, makes it very difficult to apply scientific technology. Another barrier is the dominance of the public sector, uh, where, you know, government and governing and, uh, you know, health education are often the biggest drivers of, of, of jobs. Uh, the biggest, uh, you know, portion of the GDP, but the problem with the public sector is that it's not particularly risk-taking, so it's very risk-averse, so it's not often uh, where innovation doesn't come from the public sector, uh, and when people are using taxpayers' dollars, it's, there's a, a, you know, a lot of accountability that has to happen, so you can't, you can't risk, you can't innovate with those dollars, with those processes, and there's often, there's a political cost to doing that. Uh, it's often just safer to just do, do it the way it's always been. So as long as the public sector is so dominant and is taking such a large part of the GDP in a lot of the Arctic regions, it's going to be hard for that, you know, for, the, for that region to be innovative. Uh, there's also the conservative nature of rural communities, and this is far from being an Arctic problem. This is really a characteristic of rural communities everywhere. But again, these are also tend to be risk averse, uh, where they like to do things traditional ways or the old ways. And it's probably reinforced in indigenous communities where there's a real effort to preserve and protect uh, traditional ways of knowing and doing. Uh, less entrepreneurial, and sometimes this results, especially in indigenous, indigenous communities, from a sense of communal responsibility, a sense of sharing everything you have. So there's much less incentive for individuals to strike out, uh, to take risks, and to use their own money, uh, you know, to try to do things for personal profit. And there's, you know, positives and, and, and negatives to personal profit, but it certainly drives entrepreneurship in, in cities, and that's lacking in, in much of the Arctic. There's also very little access to capital, uh, where people aren't homeowners, so they don't have, uh, you know, high education. Uh, a lot of small startups in, in southern cities get started, where, you know, initially capitalized by friends and family. Uh, when you take out a mortgage, a second mortgage on your home, those possibilities just don't exist in much of the Arctic. So even if you have a great idea, uh, you might suddenly have no capital to, to really uh, take it to the next level. And also prioritization of local knowledge, uh, which I think makes it difficult or makes it slower to transfer knowledge across uh, areas. So um, it doesn't, knowledge doesn't transfer very freely across the circumpolar north. It's often, uh, it becomes tacit, what we call tacit knowledge instead of uh, external knowledge. So, um, you know, within communities, there can be lots of innovation, lots of resourcefulness, but that often stays, uh, you know, as tacit knowledge of a person or a family or a particular community and doesn't get transferred. So that uh, a lot of innovations that might benefit people in Alaska or Greenland or Russia uh, or different territories in Canada might not get transferred because the, the culture of transferring knowledge is not the same as it is in the South. Uh, no economy of scale is a huge one. We're talking about, you know, 4 million people in the entire region, which is a huge region. Uh, but outside of a few, you know, a few cities of between 40,000 and 300,000, most of those people live in, in very small communities, sometimes off the grid. So there's simply no economy of scale. If, if you're, you know, if, if you need to invest money into an innovative idea or an innovative solution to a northern problem, there's really, really good chances that you're not going to get a return on your investment if, you, if, you're, if your scale is, you know, your territory or your community or your region or your ethnic nation. So this is where I see that the need to kind of expand, expand the, the scale, the market from just, you know, your particular nation, your particular country or your national unit to really seeing it as, as the Arctic as a whole. Uh, high entry costs in the extractive industry and and well, some people might think that the extractive industry is just you know, a bunch of laborers and it's very low tech. But in fact, in the Arctic, the extractive industry is very high tech uh, and, and very innovative. And, and uh, you know, they're multi-billion dollar projects and there's been a lot of engineering uh, kind of uh, miracles that go into some of these things. But it's very hard for northerners to get into the industry at anything other than kind of the labor, the cleaning, the janitorial, the catering, or the construction level. And there's very high entry costs to the extractive industry. So the regulatory burdens that, you know, protect the environment and the long processes, the duty to consult, consultative processes, 
make you know are, are better for the environment in the long term. But small and medium sized enterprises can't usually go the five or ten years and invest the time in the in the lawyers and the consultants that it often takes to move a project uh, in, into practice that you know the multi the, the largest mining companies in the world can. And so it really restricts it to the, you know, the 10 or 20 huge mining companies based in cities, in southern cities, and the largest cities in the world, uh, rather than northerners themselves. Uh, this, this is being ameliorated a little bit with joint ventures, limited partnerships, subcontracting. But again, those aren't, those aren't innovation drivers. Uh, those are really the kind of the, the lower skilled kinds of work. And finally, there's a lack of telecommunications infrastructure. So while the internet promises to increase access to capital, to ideas, to knowledge transfer, uh, to post-secondary and, and secondary educational opportunities, and also telehealth, uh, if, if your telecommunications infrastructure is, is too expensive uh, for most people, or if it's uh, unreliable, then again, this will really uh, limit uh, you know, how much of a solution that could be to some of the problems that we have right now. So what do I see as some strategies going forward? Um, I think governments, there's, there's some good examples in the paper that's online there. I present some examples where governments or the state has, has you know, really embraced and supported these buzzwords of innovation, entrepreneurship, commercialization. Uh, so there's you know, funds for capital investment, so for small businesses to have a better uh, access to capital that they wouldn't get through a standard traditional bank, for example. Uh, recognition, awards programs, schools programs to try to encourage either science fairs or, or inventions or entrepreneurship um, and those kinds of things. So there's, a, so there's a, a bit of a culture shift, I think, happening. I mean, it's happening everywhere. These are buzzwords that everybody's embracing, but it's reached the Arctic. Uh, and certainly in the Nordic countries, there's quite maybe more of a, a culture or a history of this. But it, on, on all these uh, examples that I examine more closely, there weren't a lot of you know, winners or great outcomes. So, so the effort is being made, the opportunities are there, uh, but right now it's very top down. Uh, so you know, it's very hard for a government to push this kind of thinking, uh, to push this kind of culture. They're making efforts, but it, it's still early days. It doesn't have to be seen to be much, very much you know, fruit from those programs yet. Uh, the other thing is, that, you know, which I struggle with philosophically, is this is a wicked problem. Uh, is is the idea, is, is the solution is going to be to make northern communities more like urban areas? Is that the goal? Is the idea is to apply southern innovations kind of in a haphazardly or, or uh, less productive or less constructive or less contextually relevant way to northern communities? And what would be, you know, what would be the end of that? What would be the outcome? Is it desirable as, at all? Uh, is it something that we want to do to, to promote STEM even in a lot of northern communities, make them Western scientists, Western engineers, uh, and Western entrepreneurs, and embrace those fundamentally Western uh, you know, concepts or, or, or values? And this is you know, problematic, especially you know, in Canada, but the, somewhere elsewhere in, in, the, in the context of residential schools and its ilk. Uh, you know, where it was, it was a, a philosophy of, of, you know, trying to kill the Indian in the child, try to make them more like us, more like white people, more like Westerners, more like Europeans. And you could see an extension of this now, that trying to uh, turn the north uh, and indigenous rural communities and more like southern cities. Uh, this is something fundamentally will get lost when and if we do that, uh, which, you know, so it's a wicked problem. What is, what is the desired outcome. I don't think there's consensus on that. Uh, so I think, you know, in the end, with the solution to almost everything in the North is to build capacity amongst Northerners themselves to identify, develop, commercialize innovations that support Northern living. Uh, so what are the outcomes that communities want to find? How can we build the capacity in that community to identify that uh, and bring it to fruition? Uh, so certainly education is a big piece of that building networks, and there's been some advances in that uh, since 1990. University of the Arctic, for example, has a lot of uh, thematic uh, networks and doing research on specific areas, promoting knowledge transfer across the circumpolar north, but this often can remain you know, within the ivory tower of universities and research institutes and not always trickle down to communities. And also promote regional economies, and, and the Nordic and the Barents region has been far advanced in this, but uh, you know, it's starting to, to um, 
improve, I think, in, in the Northwest North America with Panama, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, Arctic Caucus, so Alaska, Yukon, Northwest Territories in particular, looking at ways where they can improve their economy of scale, looking at ways that they can collaborate uh, on particular innovations or strategies that, you know, resonate with them, but they would have a hard time, uh, you know, resonating with their sovereign capitals. So I think there is some progress being made. But it's a very tricky, wicked problem. It's not unique to the Arctic, but it's exacerbated, I think, in the Arctic. Uh, but, but you know, if if Northerners can can start to be the you know the masters of of, of what kind of innovation gets applied for what purposes, uh, and kind of ownership of, of that, uh, I, I think there's a very many promising things that can happen from from the kinds of technologies that are being developed in the South and elsewhere. So. I'm hopeful that this will have an impact on, on social economic indicators.